welcome to the latest Movie Scramble podcast, where for your listening pleasure, all the gang are back together. That's right. This episode, I am joined by both John and Simi. Simi, since you've ditched us for the past few episodes, we'll start with you. How are you doing? I'm good. Well, obviously, as I was saying before, as I recalled, then I'm not going to call it man flu. Maybe I... No, I'm not, I'm not going to go to like gender stereotypes here. Uh, I <laughs> oh, I did in our previous <laughs> pod, so you're fine. <laughs> I am feeling a little under the weather, but when you mentioned we're going to be doing the open films, uh, or a couple of them, I thought, you know what, uh, come back at retirement, get the band back together. <laughs> and John, I'm assuming you're delighted about this news, that Sammy's risen from his crypt. I'm... I'm- just surprised they retired in the first place because they never told anybody they actually did that. <laughs> <laughs> this is all news. <laughs> you, you heard it here first. Yeah, but yeah, it's very nice for everybody to be in the same virtual room together again, even though, I mean, looking at you two handsome people, you know, it's just, it's, and then looking at myself in comparison, it's just, oh, there's nothing, nothing to compare to it. Says John, John has been actually, very what, humble. Hey, hey, look, he's, he's let his room, you know. I, I said this to him yesterday because yesterday he had a white <sighs> t-shirt on and he was all bronzed looking and I was like, are you lit really well? <laughs> <laughs> I wish most of the time I look as if I'm sitting in a cave. But during the day, if I'm on <laughs> Teams calls and things, it's really gloomy and dark. So I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah handsome as ever and well I'm delighted that I am joined by you two not least because you are the horror experts and I'm just here to make up the numbers so on this episode we have a spectacular double bill that will have you reaching for your holy water we are indeed discussing the first omen that's the 2024 film and the omen the 1976 film and so we'll kick off with a film that chronologically happens first which is the first omen So the film centres around Margaret, played by Nell Tiger Free, a young American nun who is called to Rome to take her vows. After a seemingly chance encounter with a father Brennan, played by Ralph Innocent, she begins to question the goings on at her new home, stumbling upon a satanic plot that is designed to force people back to the Catholic Church. So I guess it's probably pertinent to ask, what were your expectations going into this film, knowing that The Omen is such a cult classic? For me, uh, my expectations were very, very low based on the fact that the whole idea of going back and doing prequels to older properties is never seen as a particularly good idea. And about 90% of the time, it is really badly executed because it's all just about money and they don't actually put a lot of thought into really how it ties in to a film that actually was made some 45 years ago. So it didn't bode well for me. So yeah, that's pretty much where I was going in to see the film. What about you, Thomas? Yeah, pretty much the same. When I first saw the the trailer for it, it didn't do anything for me. I thought to myself, do we really need a prequel to The Omen? Where 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 is it going to go? The Omen starts with uh, the Antichrist being born. Was the prequel to that? I couldn't. I, I was. I couldn't understand what we needed, or why we needed, or what they could really do with it. It was going to make it interesting, and especially off the back of the Exorcist sequel, Legacy sequel, Stroke, re, re, whatever the hell that was last year, uh, which I did not like or enjoy at all. And I was. I was looking forward to that. Yeah, I was the same as you. I was very low expectations when it was originally announced. Mm-hmm. Mary? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I am the, I've said this a million times in this podcast, I am fed up with sequels, prequels, franchises, universe, spin-offs, whatever it is. But I must admit the trailer did pique my interest because I like the fact that it seems sort of scrambled. They use that Kill Fever Ray song that they use as part of the Vikings theme music. So I think that's what I was drawn in by more than anything else. Would you say then that your expectations were usurped after you'd seen it without giving too much away for what we're about to discuss? I would say so, yes. I enjoyed it an awful lot more than I thought I would. And we can go into the reasons why as we go on. But yes, I I was pleasantly surprised by it. I was also pleasantly surprised by the fact that this wasn't pre-announced as a trilogy. It's just, (laughs) it just came as a film, which is always very nice because that's obviously the, one of the problems that the Exorcist film had because that was a, a pre-announced trilogy which probably will not happen now but so yes positive 
Very positive. Yeah. Is me were you the same? Pretty much, but I will get this later in detail, sort of dispute that plan trilogy thing. Uh, yeah. Based Ooh, on, okay. Based on not so much issues I had with the film, but things that did take me out of it a wee bit because I was thinking about it as it was going on. I was trying hard back to the original film. But yeah, it was in terms of I'll stick my enjoyment aspect where I like this and like to later. But it did just sort of put in the sense that I was expecting more of a kind of schlocky, updated gore fest. And it wasn't that I, I wasn't expecting the slow burn handled with care film we did get. I thought they were going to try and redo it for a kind of MTV generation type thing. That's a really dated reference to use, but you know what I mean? It's that sort of, <laughs> I'm expecting jump scares and gore, and I'm expecting to do everything that the first Omen film was not. Yeah. So I'm surprised at yeah. that. I definitely mm -hmm. felt the same. I thought this is going to be a jump scare, a thon, and it, it definitely wasn't. So I would argue that other than the character of Father Brennan, I didn't think this film felt like a franchise like I would argue that you could quite happily go and see this film having never seen a single other Omen film in your life does that work for you you obviously have seen all of these films did that work for you in the same did it fall into place the way it should have yes it did fall into place basically because there was enough there for people who had seen the previous films to get out of it there was especially near the start of the film there was a couple of references visual references more than anything else mm -hmm. to the original Omen film. But if you didn't get those references, then you wouldn't be missing out on very much at all. It stood alone as its own thing. It told a story, which was nice. It, it had a start, a the beginning, a middle and an end, so you could enjoy it. And it didn't feel that at any point it was trying to sort of add elements to it that then weren't going to get realised towards the end of the film or leave things open for a second or third part or whatever. So, yeah, I was, I was quite happy with the way that it, it did kind of fit in. And Thomas mentioned that as well about the sort of the slow burn aspect. And I thought the way that they handled it was quite sympathetic towards the original film as well. So, yeah, it was good. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that, Simi. Yeah, Yes and no. I think there was parts of it, as you said, and there was a lot of wee nods and references and characters relating to the original movie that was tying in quite nicely. And it does work very well, in my opinion, as a standalone film. I think it works better as a standalone film that does a prequel, especially more of the fact that I would say it's less of a prequel and more of a soft reboot. And to me, with the way the film ended, it was clearly looking for a sequel. Hmm. and they changed enough of it that if they did go down that route, they can create sequels and create a new trilogy without having to worry too much about events of the first movie. Slight wee differences, things you make kind of blink and you miss, unless you you know the first film, uh, the original film, pretty well. And, yeah, so I think it works better as... I think it worked better separate from the original Omen movie because of how much they change. And in my opinion, it was quite clear that they're looking for a second film in this. They introduce, again, not spoilers, but they introduce new characters that were in particular towards the end that, unless you introduce that character, there's, there's zero point of that happening in the movie unless it's going somewhere. I totally get what you're saying, but equally as I was watching, I was thinking, well, how can they possibly world build? Because the next film is The Omen, right? So unless they're trying to squeeze in another film somehow before, I understand what you're saying, but I, I just don't know where there is room for this to go, because presumably the next step is the, unless, of course, they remake The Omen, which they already have done with, is it, is it Naomi Watts? It's in the, the uh, Leaf Shriver. The, the yeah. yeah, so they've already remade that. I mean, I suppose they could reboot it again because that is what Hollywood tends to do but I, I'm, 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 I'm it's curious because for me I don't know how they, they sort of build out from here as you see other than just a soft reboot so it does feel like me because I say the change enough the change things from the first movie that it wouldn't link in neatly to the original and then there's this new character at the end it's never been mentioned once in any other film 
Mm-hmm. And unless you're bringing that character into it, for a, there's no there's no reason for that character to be in the film unless they've got a role in something that happens next. Yeah, there's also a a major plotline change as well. Something that's not brought up during the the first couple of Omen mm-hmm. films, the, the original ones, where it's all got to the 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 plot involving the Catholic Church mm-hmm. as part of this. That's a different angle and I can see it being a, a subsequent film being built on that as well as events that happen at the end of the, the first film as well so there's a couple of things there you can say yes that can take it forward into another film but if they didn't it would be enough I'd be quite happy if they if, yeah. see if they said there's there's no more films there probably will be I think it's probably been successful enough that it probably will Mm-hmm. Get it. I see because these films don't cost an awful lot of money to make in the sort of grand scheme of things. So really? they'll, they'll realize a filming in Rome is that not quite expensive? I think they get grants and all sorts of th- right. stuff. Rome is reasonable to film in, as is like sort of major parts of Europe, but there's certain areas, yes, it would, would be more difficult. But there's ways to keep production costs low, for instance, it was like a first time director. And like you mm-hmm. say, a lot of the cast weren't particularly well known as well. There's a few names in there, but not many. Yeah. Probably just enough to get the production off the ground so they could yeah. actually get it made and everything. But yeah, I think you're right. There's enough there to get something else going, but on its own, the film stands. Yeah, I, I actually disagree with the making it, but it's not made a lot. No? Not even for it for the It was, um, well, again, I don't know if the numbers are accurate, but I've got the Wikipedia. Which to be fair, usually it's fairly accurate when it comes to a budget. And I've not checked box office mojo or anything, but in a budget of 30 million, it's brought back 50. Mm. And it, you probably want to double that. At least. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I would have thought because I saw the more, what, what, as soon as I booked tickets for it, maybe that's just algorithms, but as soon as I booked tickets for it, I started to see it everywhere. And so I just assumed, and the cinema we were in was busy. So I just assumed a lot of people were going to. To see it and i have heard a lot of people talking about it as well which is quite unusual for people to actually be going to cinema releases and being excited about them so i'm, I'm surprised at that but i mean who knows i think a lot of these films are obviously designed to to world build and we can get on how to how it sort of links to the omen <laughs> later on this is so tricky to actually say this because I, I, I mean in my head one of the things i really liked about the film was to me it looked like those gustave dory paintings that go along with like dante's inferno and I thought that the set design and the cinematography and just the setup of so many of the shots was really like you were stepping into this sort of like medieval painting. Like, what were your thoughts on how the look of the film? Because I think it is quite distinct looking. It doesn't look like a sort of standard modern horror film. It's not done that way at all. Like you say, there is a, a lot of thought has gone into the way they've actually put the design. No, I'm not saying that films don't normally, but they've they've gone for a particular look. They've made use of the fact that it's set in the mid-70s, so therefore they can. there's a lot of... It's like when we were talking about Late Night with the Devil, there's a lot of browns and yeah. <laughs> very sort of muted colours in there because of the, the period and everything. But yes, it, it did work particularly well and it was able to create a certain amount of atmosphere just from the look of it without them actually having to put any dialogue or anything on screen you got a sense of what they were trying to get across yeah i thought the i love the look of the film very good aesthetics and i, I hate it you know i hate the term elevated horror i, I can't stand that <laughs> no i'm not gonna go down it but i just i hate that term however i can see people calling it that because of the sort of slow burn gorgeous looking yeah. lingering shots it wasn't it wasn't your as we mentioned earlier it wasn't your jump scares it wasn't um a uh, quick cut gore festival that and yeah i thought the film was was gorgeous to look at really eerie as well real atmospheric and i just i don't know if things like that also went against the film in maybe, what way well maybe people were just looking for something a bit more yeah you know, Blumhouse, because I really like Blumhouse films, but something a bit more pop, pop, popcorn for the date night movie. It was not a date night movie in the slightest. No, it did make me want to sew my vagina up, so definitely not a, definitely not a date night movie. Take, I think take away the, sorry, I was going to say, take, take away the, um, the name recognition from that film. Yeah. I don't think that's a film you expect. 
it really it smashed the box office regardless of the reviews because it is very much that's got it's got that kind of cult horror feel almost in a way. I think it was that one we watched a few years ago and I kinda remember the end of it. It was a possession film. Possessor? No. The Cronenberg film, no? No, no, no. Um, we did a podcast on it. I can't remember the actual <laughs> this. It's good. Uh, you'll know the film. Okay. That was because I think yeah, it's definitely not a jump scare film. I think for me anyway, I don't know if that's just because I went to a Catholic school, but nuns and empty churches are generally quite scary for me anyway. <laughs> so anytime there was a long corridor, I think maybe you were expecting someone to pop out from behind a door or something. I don't know. So because as we were talking about on other podcasts, we're so conditioned to look for these jump scares now. And I, I definitely think this purposely took a step back from this, but obviously the horror is realized in in other ways. Do you remember the name of the film we talked about? <laughs> I'm looking for it's really in my head because I can see the actress as well. Um, Who's the actress? We can help can you. Oh my god! I can, the only thing I can remember the film is the end when she emulates herself. Spoiler oh. alert! We can cut that. Saint Maud. Saint Maud. Yes, that. Yes, that's a very good film as well. I can see. Are, are you thinking they're quite similar? Not necessarily in terms of like um, like plot or that. Or slightly less fetish, slightly less. I'm, I'm it reminded me of that in the sense that that's not the film you come out and go, that's quite smash the box office, regardless yeah. of the years. That's, that's what I meant with kind of first omen in the sense it didn't feel like a film that was designed for a mass worldwide appeal. It felt it's, it's not quite cerebral horror, but mm. it's but it's not jump scare horror either. Because I think that what's nice about this film is as well, there's actually quite clear allusions to other horror films in it as well. Like there was definitely like the Moon or a streetlight shot from The Exorcist, and obviously towards the end there is a clear rip off of Possession as well. Does that work? Do you need to be a horror buff to enjoy a film like this? No, no, not at all. No, it works on different levels for different people. Like I said earlier, with the references to other Roman films, if you catch them and you enjoy them, same as any type of film, if you catch a reference to something and you enjoy it, and you can go, ah, it's like the. Mm -hmm. the, the Leo meme for he yes. from yeah. you know, he <laughs> yeah. points at the screen it's that kind of thing you know if you get it then you, you can feel a wee bit smug for a couple of minutes and think you're superior to everybody else and there's probably like a, about 100,000 other people who've got exactly the same thing but no it doesn't detract from it whatsoever people enjoy things in totally different levels yeah, uh, just that's that's the thing. I just didn't feel like it was really kind of going to appeal to a wider audience and that thing because it's a very visceral film as well. It's mm -hmm. a hard watch and it's uncomfortable. And a certain type of person likes a film that's uncomfortable, whether it's in its themes or its imagery. Yeah, it's not something you come out of cinema laughing about, really. Even like a, good, a good horror film, you can kind of go, oh, it was fun. It's not a fun movie in the slightest. No, and I think that's what really stood out for me is that. As a film, this seemed to have a lot to say about patriarchal or religious structures and ownership over women's bodies. I think that horror in particular almost sort of fetishizes violence towards women's bodies. And this film definitely leans into that, but in a very different, very visceral way. How do you think it tackles? Because these are big themes. And it goes beyond a sort of like, all oh, the omens, this cult classic. I think this is quite a deep and quite a, a meaningful or exploration of that type of thing. What what did you take away from that? And how do you think that was realised? Do you think it was done well? Could they have done more of it? No, I think it was done well. And I say that as somebody that's never going to birth a child. <laughs> and I, I think it did have a very strong message that, again, like I said, it worked better as a standalone film as opposed to a prequel to the omen based on that because it did have it, it did feel like a different film franchise completely and i know if i say they're a bit soft but idea maybe that's the plan it i'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on the original omen later on recovered mm -hmm. it but to me you're right this did have a very deep message to it and it was very like I said, visceral it's very layered and how it gets its message across as well. And it's a hard watch at times. And that's fine because it's a horror movie. And horror movies aren't always slasher in the woods, rooting for the bad guy type thing. In this, it is difficult not to root for the main character. Uh, there's very clear evil people in this film. But as John mentioned as well, the wee twist to the originals, they find they're the good guys, which is even more scary. 
Yeah. And that goes back to what you're saying about the kind of the women's bodies thing and that. I, I don't believe a lot of these guys that pass policies and things are doing it out of malice and evilness. I genuinely think they believe they're doing the right thing, and that's what makes it even worse. And also, oh, definitely. I mean, care. I think the what what's interesting is that obviously this film is, you know, the premise is that the Catholic Church is losing numbers and in brackets, therefore money, which mm. is, let's be honest, what this all boils down to. So it's like, also, if we can birth an antichrist, everyone will come back to church because everyone's going to be shit scared and we'll make our money again. So it's this sort of abuse of structure and power and obviously people's natural fears. And I think it it, it goes in really off the deep end, I think, in, in actually pushing this thing of, you know, obviously it's using the Catholic Church as the example, but I think it's maybe talking about bigger sort of societal issues of how women's health and well-being or just even treatment within a within this particular type of structure is, is abused. And I think that, you know, Arkasha Stevenson, the director, makes some really bold decisions by what she shows and doesn't show, which I think is quite important as well. But I think definitely it, it leans into that horror element of women's bodies are often fetishized with or violence towards women's bodies in particular are often fetishized towards these type in these types of films. Sorry. John, I don't know what you thought about I mean there's obviously quite a, there's some quite graphic birthing scenes mm-hmm. as well. I don't know what you thought when you were watching it. How do you think it was handled? Do you think it showed enough? Do you think it showed too much? You know, what what were your thoughts on that? I think it showed enough. I don't think it went too far because then you get into the sort of gore type of horror and this film was never going to be like that. The more extreme elements of the film were there to emphasise the story and to push the story forward. They were never there to just for, like, to give you a jump scare or to give you anything like that. And the way that that these scenes were built up. They were built up quite gradually. You would have lots of chanting and things like that, <laughs> that type of music. So it was a build up of things and it wasn't felt in any way that the music was going to drop and then it was going to be like a, huh? you know, that kind of thing. I, I liked the way that they they approached that though, because obviously they were, they were looking to try and find an aspect that was going to be unique to this film rather than just regurgitating the same sort of thing that they've, they've, they've done on four films and a remake already so the fact that it was set in 1971 and that was in the middle of all the sort of student unrest and everything so there was a lot of people talking about a lot of things to do with society a lot of a lot of things came out of that like like the women's lib sort of all that came out of that sort of period as well so yeah the I think by drawing all those elements into the film and taking some of them, but not all of them, they touched on the sort of student aspect of it because that's the way that society was changing. In general, people were questioning more things, so therefore people were not going to church because why go to church? Because oh, this is a money-making scheme because for so many years or centuries they talked about it, that the church was there and it made money and people listened to the church and people did what the church told them. They gave them 10% of their salary and all this kind of thing, all that various religions, you know, so it was all rebelling against that. And I thought, yeah, that if anything, they were more restrained in some of these scenes than I thought they may have been, you know, there was obviously discussions had gone on about what they should and shouldn't do. And, you know, whether the, they should go to these sort of extremes and I think they decided to kind of, no, no, we'll just temper it because it fits in with what what we're trying to get across as a message here, in addition to the story of the film. And, I mean, you've got to applaud them for that because it would have been so easy for them to say, right, yeah, just blood and guts everywhere. Like, for instance, I saw a film a couple of weeks ago, Abigail, and supposedly it's had the most blood on screen of any movie in like the last 20 years or something. So, you know, that's an extreme and that's a choice that filmmakers have made, but the filmmakers here have chosen, no, we're, we're fitting this in in a certain way to a, a franchise, which is already there, but we're making our own film at the same time. We're making our own mark. And by doing, you know, by adding these elements in, that's how they're making their own mark, I think. Yeah, and the messages and themes of the movie didn't bog down the plot, it no. complemented it really nicely. It worked in tandem uh, to make it, made it more horrific. And as you were mentioning about the, the, the protest in the film and the unrest, the time setting, although it had to be a certain time for the prequel, wasn't 
it, it made it made sense as well because it, it wasn't a mistake, it wasn't an accident. So it's just uh, picking that time frame because it also allows you to show those protests. Mm-hmm. Again, it's not very subtle. We think, oh, the Catholic Church <laughs> and it comes to women's bodies. <laughs> it, it's that kind of way that they do treat the main characters. I can't remember the name off the top of my head now. The main character, they do Margaret. Treat, yeah, they do treat Margaret and yeah. other women as just commodities. Yeah, well, this film had the same effect on me as like the Invisible Man because I came out of this being like, yeah, nobody ever listens to women and blah 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 because that's exactly how I felt coming out of, of uh, the Invisible Man. I think that what I thought was quite interesting was when the Spanish nun, who was seen as the you know the bit of the the rebel, when she took her vows, there was this obviously very lingering set of shots over her, you know, because she's dressed like a bride and there's you know the big performance of the the ceremony and even that in itself made me feel like icky because there was just something there again it was like about taking ownership over somebody else's whole life in this case obviously because she's dedicated her time to being a nun but in essence her body as well because she now belongs to the church and her hair has to get cut and she has to dress a certain way so I thought it was delivered and really well I think I don't know if it was maybe ratings that made them choose to show or not show what they did but I do think it worked quite well I also loved the image where Margaret is praying and the candles are around her, like a set of jaws, as in she's literally trapped in yeah. the institution. What were kind of standout sort of images for or scenes for for you guys in that sense? Because I, I do think it, it chose it or the director chose their imagery very, very well. And everything was sort of everything felt loaded with with some sort of other message. Yeah, and like I said, it wasn't bogging anything down either. And yeah. I'm just going to mention one thing. I'm not going to go into detail of it, but it's quite spoilery. The bad room, that's all I'm going to say. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good, yeah. I liked the... the you previously mentioned it, the taking the veil, as they called it. Yeah. And at the end of the ceremony, she lies face down as if she's a cross, and then all the other nuns join in as well. That was really creepy because that's like, that's kind of reinforcing the, yeah, you're giving your body and your soul to to Christ and the church, and, you know, they all belong to the church now. So I thought that was a particularly powerful one, especially because it, the, the camera kind of panned out just from her mm-hmm. and showed all of them just lying there. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was yeah. particularly good, yeah. Nuns are skinny. I'm going to yep. say it again. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> um, so, so what did you think of the performances? You know, we don't have too many big names in here. You've obviously got Charles Dance and Bill Nye as a collection of creepy priests. But you've got the likes of Neil Tiger Free, obviously, in the lead role, and Ralph Innocent as, as Father Brennan, which is your tie into the, the, the omen itself. What did you think of the performances in general here? Yeah, they were good. I would have to say there wasn't really like a total standout performance. The the character of Margaret was a difficult one because she's on screen for quite a period of the, the film. I would say the majority of the film, probably about 75%, 80%. So it's really on her shoulders and she is quite a young actor, but she accounted for herself pretty well. I must say that other characters, Bill Nye, for instance, when I saw him on screen for the first time, you kind of get an, an idea of how the film is going to end yeah. right, right from yeah. that. So yeah. you, <laughs> you, it's just, and that's just through having seen so many films in general, you've got a good yeah. idea of exactly what's going to happen. Now, they tried to confuse you a wee bit with a few sort of red herrings along the way with regards to who was actually the, the chosen one and everything like mm-hmm. that. And but. It didn't really wash. I kind of knew what was going on. But yeah, the performances were pretty good. I think, uh, is it Ralph Innocent? Yeah. He said? Yeah. yeah. He was on a hiding to nothing because the Patrick Troughton version of that character was completely over the top. It was this sort of yeah. mad raving priest. So he didn't try to go down that route. He tried to do something slightly different. But yeah, it was it was good. It was uh, They were all fairly solid, yeah. In a way, though, it made me wonder, like, is that what Father Brennan was like? And then just nobody listened to him, so he became Patrick <laughs> Stroud in his crazy eyebrows. Is that what happened? Well, in the original film, he says he was at the birth. So maybe that mm. group is saying, although in this one, he's not. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he changed about me, but I get a lot of big spoils or anything, but his mother's a jackal. That wasn't the case in this one. 
And again, it's just wee things like that they've changed. But I wouldn't say to make the film as such, but with such a been, been known what happened in the original film, I'm watching it going, we changed that. And I, that's why it wasn't the film as finished. I thought, is that a soft reboot they're going for? They, they, they've changed too much. And it's not what they've changed with things by accident. They've deliberately made a conscious decision to change things in the movie to make us stuff. But it wouldn't work otherwise. Yeah, I feel like the filmmakers change. perhaps didn't anticipate your level of attention to detail. No, no, no. The, 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 the Born of a Jackal thing is, is prevalent through all the movies. No, no, I just mean because you're noticing all these other little like tweaks and ah. stuff like that. And I can just imagine you sitting there going, is that a choice or is that a mistake? So now I feel like they well, owe you a letter of explanation as to why they've done what they've done. You can cut this bit if you want and then cut as a spoiler, I suppose. But through the original film and through all the movies, he constantly talks about his mother's a jackal. Mm-hmm. And this is his father. It's a jackal-like mm-hmm. demon creature. Mm-hmm. If his mother was a jackal, you couldn't get this film. That is he's not a jackal, he's not a cruel human person. Yeah. Who happens mm-hmm. to be, yes, the birth of the, the daughter of the Antichrist type thing. But yeah, if they, they didn't make that change, it, you can't do that for long. Yeah. Um, do you want to hear a random fun fact? Mm-hmm. Go on. The guy that Margaret meets in the nightclub, Paolo, who she dances with and gets a bit sweaty and sexy with, his real life surname is Archangeli, which obviously is Italian for Archangel, which I just think is so <laughs> bizarre. That is bizarre. Obviously, his character did not meet a particularly uh, angelic fate, but we'll not go into that. Um, so, obviously. So, I was about to mention also about the performances there. Oh, I sorry. Yes, of course, of course. I thought the performances were well solid. Um, but for me, Bill Naye, right at the start, and every time I was in the film, took me out a wee bit. And I think a last part of that is due to the fact that he was in Hot Fuzz. And Hot Fuzz. <laughs> was, no, 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 let me finish. Hot Fuzz does have some tr- uh, homages to the Omen in it. Uh huh. Mm hmm. And <laughs> okay. I, I, well, first song, I was like, why am I expecting, why, why am I, why do I feel like I want to laugh here? And I find that I'm just in my head. I feel like he was doing a bit of twirly moustache. It know, was, yeah. I don't think it fitted the, I don't think it fitted yeah. the film. It, we'll talk about the Patrick Trouton character soon, but yeah, it's, uh, I don't think the twirly <laughs> moustache worked as well. But yeah, it did also make me think of that bit in Hot Fuzz when it, there's a clear homage to the first Omen. I was thinking um, more underworld because he was a particularly twirly, yeah. twirly moustache vampire in that. Really, <laughs> man, you just grow a moustache and twirl it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that he. I would say that his was the only performance that took me out of it. I feel like everybody else did a very serious job, and because like Charles Dance, there when obviously he shows up in the beginning scenes. To me, I'm like, oh, I'm expecting something serious, moody, scary here. And I almost thought, should they have swapped them around in terms of performance? Because I feel like you always anticipate a certain kind of caliber yeah. from Charles Dance, which I don't think mm. Bill Nye really gave us here. But I think you're right. I think Charles Dance would have been better on that role. And, yeah, and I don't know why. Well, anyway, it's obviously a decision that was made sort of a long time ago. Um, so the film is set in 1970s Rome, which it tries to catch the spirit of through, you know, nightclubs and, you know, a mere mention of the US ambassador at the time, which brings us swiftly on to The Omen, another film that would put you off parenthood for life. So this stars Robert Thorne. No, it doesn't star Robert Thorne. It stars Gregory Peck <laughs> as Robert <laughs> Thorne. <laughs> I'm on a different planet at the moment. So he is the US ambassador to Rome and his wife, Catherine, played by Lee Remick, gives birth to a baby who dies not long after delivery. And a mysterious priest just happens to be on hand to offer Robert another newborn. And as the child starts to grow, strange things keep happening. Is Robert and Catherine's son, Damien, the Antichrist? So you've obviously seen this film before, both of you. What were your first thoughts of sort of going back, having seen the first Roman the quality and the style is obviously slightly different. What was your viewing experience like watching this back? I'll go first then. Yeah, I think my opinions were different to yours. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I was one of these people who saw The Omen fairly early on. I mean, it was come out what nineteen seventy six, so I would have been yes. a wee bit young to see it at the time. So I probably surely not thought, even born. I was ten. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't have seen it until maybe like maybe the late 70s early 80s when it was like 
the, the Christmas Day film or something. I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of these films. That, it was a big deal at the time. It really was. And I think it would it'd probably been in video or something. I saw it first time. So, and I enjoyed it at the time, as did a lot of people, because it was regarded as a very good horror film at the time. Whether it is aged particularly well is another matter, though, because having watched it again, there are certain sort of clunky elements to it in terms of the storytelling and the way that it's shot as well. So in some respects, it hasn't aged well, but in other respects, it stands up. And I think a lot of that's got to do with the sort of main performances more than anything else, because you've got two well-known well-renowned actors in the lead roles and Patrick Troughton. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas. Uh, um, I, I, could, I don't know how old it was when I saw The Omen, but I saw the, the second one first. So, Why? Uh, Why do you always well, do that? It was on TV. It was on TV. You know, I was young. Right. You, you need to remember, you're a bit younger than us, so there was a time when you just watched it was on telly. You didn't have the ability to go and look for stuff. You should have something was Wait on. Wait a minute. Are you, you lecturing it? me on in my day? We only had five <laughs> channels because we're pretty much the same age. Four channels. Four channels. <laughs> See, you said five. Four channels. <laughs> right, okay. I may be a wee bit younger. But no, it was that a fair one. The one two was on one time. My dad was talking about that. I was watching that. And then it was like, however long it was later, I watched the first one. And I was never that impressed by it. In the same way that it's held in this high regard, greatest horror movie of all time. And I've watched that a couple of times since. And I watched it again recently. Obviously. I watched it before I went to see the first film and thinking, right, do some homework here, watch it again. And my opinion hadn't changed. I still think it's insanely overrated. I agree with John says a lot of it's not dated. But what I found, and I don't know if this is a dating issue or it's always been like this, it's a total. It's, it's farcical in terms. It's like a Hammer horror movie. And I mean that with great respect to Hammer. This isn't this highbrow horror movie people seem to think it is. It's absolutely insane. It's so over the top. It's so cheesy and hammy. Yeah, you get great performances with guys like Gregory Peck. But you always have a straight man in these kind of films. Mm-hmm. Like Patrick Troughton, the, the bit when he's trying to explain to Gregory Peck about him, um, he's about uh, the Damien's real mother. And rather than just <laughs> rather than just say she was born of a jackal, it was really something mental in itself. He keeps going, his mother Mr. Thorne, his mother and he keeps going, You're talking about my wife, his mother, you're talking and it, it goes to say it and it gets cut off and went, why is he taking so long to say this? And then there's a scene just before he's uh, spoiler alert death. He's running towards the the church and there's this clear like fake storm happening which i don't yeah. mind i don't I, I don't mind that it looks terrible because i like things i said i've got a red hammer uh charm to it but he's running towards the church supposed to be against the wind it's not that windy and we <laughs> things like that i'm watching going i don't mind this i don't mind this looking terrible because yeah it's the 80s it's an old film but it makes me films from that era and earlier but in my opinion we're doing it much better this to me is a fun movie. It really is. I don't. I, I just think it's very overrated. I don't get this love people have for it as some highbrow horror. But it's really not. Richard Donner, great director, big fan. Um, I don't know, obviously one of his earlier films. The sequels are what they are. I'll, I'll talk about them in a bit once we get a chance. But yeah, I like it. It's a good film. But even the end of the film, the last scene. How you can take that and be terrified by it. It's not scary. You're supposed to laugh, in my opinion. Mm. Because it's really very much a nudge, nudge wink to the audience. The, yeah, kid's, I mean, great. I think... the kid's great as well. I thought the kid was great in that because unlike the remake, when I said the group chat, the other day, as well having him a devil costume for Halloween. <laughs> the kid in the original, it's just like a kid. It's just a kid's act. The kid in the yeah. remake has this evil face the entire time. I'm just like, oh, for fuck's sake, man, this is terrible. And the remake's a beat-for-beat beat remake. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's awful. Which does seem to be the case in a lot of these things. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I I will admit I had never seen The Omen before I went to see the first Omen. 
and came home, realised it was on Disney Plus and started watching it. And yeah, I think I perhaps have been spoiled by the, the gloss and the intellect that was on display in the, the first Omen. And I think I was expecting something a lot more challenging. But yeah, you're right. It's got very it's very hammer. And there's a lot of footsteps, like clunky footsteps across polished floors and a lot of quite cheesy dialogue. And I get yeah, and it, obviously the the end shot is like the famous shot but even that just made me think I just want to book fuck, fuck out this weekend like not like I wasn't scared or anything I just thought he was a wee shite so which is probably an understatement for the antichrist I, I appreciate but it just um yeah I don't know it didn't hit home as hard as I thought it was going to and so in that sense I didn't feel that the omen was as effective at creating this sense of sort of panic and dread compared to the first omen I'm assuming you both felt the same. Yeah, it was paced in a very different way mm. uh, with this film, and it was it's one of the problems that a lot of films do have in that they base everything around certain set pieces. So the set pieces in here were the certain the horror elements, like mm -hmm. the oh no, I'm thinking about the second one actually. Where women get a big truck? <laughs> no, uh, they're they're based around these big sort of horror elements and in between times it can be a bit slow and it can drag like the basically about a third of this film is a, a detective procedural mm -hmm. where they go hunting for clues and they spend ages doing that and it doesn't help when they're in like there's a graveyard scene for instance where they're trying to find uh, his son's body i think it is and the mm -hmm. his, his own son and th that's done really really badly because it's obviously been shot in a sound stage but it looks as if it's been shot in a sound yeah. stage really really cheaply there's nothing that makes it look authentic in any way it's kind of glossy and everything it's like it's almost like you could have like a romantic scene in the same sort of you know they would pull everybody out from that film and then say next and pull everybody else in for the romantic scene and the yeah. dogs and all that now if you have a number of dogs attacking you in a graveyard, and I think it was about four or five of them, you're not coming out. You know, you, you read all these stories about people getting attacked by dogs, and that's it. Now, these two guys managed to get away from all these bloody dogs <laughs> without really so much as a scratch on them, and you're going, that's, that's something else. Am I mistaken, or was that where the term devil dog came from? From that type of film? Because those dogs were regarded as being sort of devil dogs them and uh, the doberman pinchers were regarded as devil right. dogs as well for a while but i don't know if it came from this particular film but I thought the it would seem they apt they did yes yeah, I, thought I, was just thinking, I was just thinking sort of like sort of modern culture yeah that yeah. would make sense i mean i'm laughing at what you're saying as well because also obviously gregory peck quite famously demanded some reshoots in this film because he was worried that he looked like he did double turn in his polonex so the thought of him <laughs> who's obviously maybe not at his peak <laughs> out running these dogs somehow or getting yeah, over a fence right. just didn't seem realistic so <laughs> but sammy what about you what were your thoughts on sort of pacing dread tension john's right the film is quite slow um again no it, it, it's not a Jump horror, even even like we kind of modern horror. There are a few things. jump scares in there. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's not like a, every few minutes cats jump. Uh, that it's the, the music really helps carry it because the soundtrack is absolutely outstanding and it's yeah. so loud, but in a good way. With the weather, that's just bad sound mixing. Or it's deliberate to just kind of jolt you. It does get your attention, and every time you hear it, even if the scene is really ridiculous and daft. That music is so serious and evil sounding. Yeah. And it's almost like a warning that even if the scene is stupid, it complements it well. Mm -hmm. And that's why I like some of the, the, the that's why I like the Patrick Trout and Gregory Peck scenes because one is just totally like straight faced acting his, his heart out, and the other one is <laughs> doing what he's doing. <laughs> but I like, I like the patches over the top. I love the fact that he's just uh, chewing the scenery. And he's playing up this mad priest type thing. So there's a lot of that kind of like imbalance in the film that works well for it. It is really nicely shot, in my opinion. It's got it's it's also a really rich family. 
his big yeah. stay, like, stately house and things like that. And you know, the ambassador off- and his young trophy wife, because I'm assuming that Gregory Peck is probably a bit on the old side to be a first time dad. And yet, here we are. <laughs> and it's that kind of way. It's, it's John was as well. There's a lot of bits that just seem to like happen for the sake of a set piece. And most notably, the nanny. Um, mm. We do pay homage to in the first omen as well. A very similar scene. That is a plot device as well. That scene does happen. So we bring in Billy Whitelaw as the new nanny. And obviously she's like a disciple of Satan. But <laughs> the whole build up to it is so over the top. There is, you could have had that, you could have had to just like get up on a bus or something, or have a cold, or anything. She could have died in any way to the mover. But it's this big grand spectacle when she's told to commit suicide by a dog. Well, I think also it's as well as if you didn't get the fact that, you know, which it almost was a wee bit insulting to viewers, if you didn't get the fact that, you know, all the animals running away from Damien at the zoo meant he was not good. It was like, here's another hint that he's not a good wee boy. And I, I did feel it was a wee bit spelling it out for the viewer, I guess. I don't, that know, type I, of don't thing. Think, I don't think it was ever meant to be a mystery. I don't think, like, I mean, the new one, they put a wee twist on things because obviously everybody knows the story really well and they want to do something different. But mm-hmm. I, I didn't see this film when it first came out, obviously, but I don't think it was ever meant to be a is he, is he not? I think it was always, I mean, the soundtrack alone, in my opinion, was telling you he was evil. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was ever meant to be a is he, is he not? There's a police procedural aspect that John mentioned, but I think it was always meant to be like, this kid's a devil. It's just a matter <laughs> how we get there to everybody else finding out. But regarding yeah. the animal bit, when they go to the zoo, the scene with the baboons attacking the car, that's pretty, pretty uh, scary. Yeah, yeah, that was, was a moment that did make me jump out my skin. Before we go on to performances, because I know the two of you are absolutely champing the bit to talk about Patrick Troughton, I can actually feel it burning through Simi. Quick thoughts on the violence, because obviously we've talked about the tension and how it's a wee bit kind of cheesy and stuff at times. Do you think the actual violence of the film stands up? It's nowhere near as graphic, obviously, as the first omen, presumably for whatever reason back in the 70s. But I thought some of the like some of the deaths made me laugh, which is clearly not the point of this film. <laughs> yeah, the problem is, well, I was thinking, I thought I was thinking about that, especially the. I don't want to say the characters. Name, I thought, you know, like, the film's fifty years old. If you've not seen it, you can right. spoil. Yeah, you can spoil yeah. this. You mean the David Warner character Jennings? Yeah, the photographer. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> he gets decapitated with the glass. <laughs> Obviously, it's so it's bad that that made me piss myself laughing because <laughs> it's so obviously a fake head. By the way, it bounces. It's shit. But I'm also watching this by the vision of like I haven't seen Final Destination, and it's so many like deaths in the film are just very much like Final Destination. It's clearly cool inspired by it, where it's like, oh, this guy kind of knocks the handbrake off and it slides in the hole. He happens to drop his uh, sandwich or something, so he has to pick up at the right moment. And it's just it's. It is, but it, there's, there's not a lot of blood and gore in the film. Um, there's not, no. There's not, and I think <laughs> if, if it's a good thing going by the... That, that, that's, that's probably the most like, uh, over-the-top death in the film. You've got the nanny hangs herself, and that's quite brutal, to be fair, because it's like, I mean, it is pretty over-the-top in the sense of how she does it. It's very much a spectacle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I, say, I don't know, know if there's any need for that in terms of uh, the plot. But it just seems to draw a lot of attention to the family. Um, but yeah, the, the decapitating head was, was outstanding. That was brilliant. And that really made me laugh. Because it just, <laughs> as you say, it's like this whole notion of like these sort of serendipitous moments where so so has to lean at this point and then that, that therefore that causes the truck to do this, that, and the next thing. But I think it was just the fake head really tipped me over the edge because it's so obviously a fake, it's just not even a good good one. Well, but then you get um, Farrell Brennan's death, which I think has done really well. Again, very film destination yes, but hmm. it's so sudden. Yeah, that's that is done very, very well. <laughs> and since you've mentioned him, the link between the two films is Father Brennan. So I'm gonna unleash you both. Tell me about Patrick Trout. <laughs> Sorry, you go first. You've been bursting. No, no, no. Well, I've, I've kind of made my point with it. I love, I love over top. It, it suits me because it's like a Hammer Horror film. And I mean that with great respect to both the Omen and Hammer Horror. I don't mean that as a derogatory term. It's just no devil looks at Hammer Horror and goes, oh, yeah, Christopher Lee film is really highbrow. 
they don't they don't look like uh, come through Dracula or something and think <laughs> Seven Brides of Dracula Part Five or something and go yeah do you know what this is what they called elevated horror back in the day. It's really not. It is what it is, and it's fine for that. It's campy and it's cheesy. I think the woman is very campy and cheesy as well. And performances like this really add to it. It does stand out a bit compared to Gregory Peck, but it doesn't stand out compared to other characters, in my opinion. Even Billy Whitelaw is really kind of over the top and this evil nanny. And she might seem really subdued at first, but towards the end, she's just going total batshit. Yeah. yeah and then you totally. go in the... Oh, I can't believe he's the archaeologist guy who gives him the daggers... Uh, he's not uh, toning it down either. <laughs> I don't think toning it down was ever one of the directorial notes that they got in this. Um, I just, I, I, I can Sorry. marvel at the spectacle of Patrick Troughton's eyebrows all day, which I think make it make his character seem even more insane because it's like, what stage in your life have you got to that your eyebrows are taking up a solid third of your face? But you know, go back to Patrick Troughton, I mentioned this earlier, the scene when he's trying to convince them these sons are crazy, but rather than oh, he's just, speaking in riddles, he's speaking in riddles constantly, and I think the dialogue suits that kind of character. But he keeps going, His mother must have fallen, his mother, and it starts saying Bon of a Jackal. What does that even mean, Bon of a Jackal? No, what it literally means is the child was born from a jackal, his mother is a little jackal. That's what he means. But I thought the devil was a goat. Well, you go to the because they go to the gravesite as well, and they open it, and you see the jackal's bones, and they think, "Well, I'll open this up by a wee baby jackal, and it's not it's his son with a big fucking bash in his head," which I think was pretty brutal. Um, yeah, why did they have to bash his head in? Why could they not just strangle a baby? It's not as if it's going to put, put up a fight, you know. <laughs> I, I, I John, the, that, uh, the expert baby killer, just giving some <laughs> tips here that you don't actually need to bash their heads in. It's really easy to strangle them. I suppose. Um, a, it shows how evil they are. And B, oh, I suppose, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's, 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 it's this fetish of him opening and going, they killed my son. With mm. him an autopsy on the bones and see if he was strangled. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's a dialogue in the film, I think, and someone's like, he's saying, she was born of a jackal. It just, just, you see, he's speaking, I'll just talk. And I've even got the archaeologist guy, and he's giving me daggers, and he's like, she to take him to sacred ground and lay him down and stab the, and his face across him. I said, why is it so hard? And I guess the Antichrist is hard to kill him. Well, that seems like a very obscure and specific way to kill him. We try <laughs> shooting them, we try drowning them, we just try and push them off a cliff. These daggers, that seems like a very weird way to kill him, in my opinion, but yeah, I thought Patrick I don't know if that was a, I, I obviously do not know my Bible well enough, but I wondered if that was like some sort of biblical reference, like does it say somewhere that this is how you specifically have to do it? Because you're right, it was such a specific, I can't just, <coughs> you know, put the wee fucker somewhere, why does it have to be this specific death? Yeah, maybe it was just Kelly's soul or something, but they don't explain it, they don't explain a lot in the film, we feel like I just gloss over things. And they do make a lot of stuff up in regards to the Bible as well. They just start making shit up, especially towards the third film. And that's fine. You know, that's perfectly fine. Because it's not a documentary. It's not a documentary. It's not based on a true story. You can invent with stuff. But the problem with that is, and I think people then watch these films and think that is what is in the Bible. And then they start misinterpreting things like that. But, uh, sure. yeah, but if you want to talk about expert baby colors, watch the third one. Jesus Christ. See, is I he feel in it? like... I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Have you I feel about- like I've seen all the omen that I need to see though, because this is what I don't understand, right? Obviously they set it up at the end, like the wee kid does the sort of like wink to camera basically. <laughs> I mean, like does he get older? Do we see him taking over the world? Like what uh, actually we, we, we wouldn't want to spoil it for you, but he does get older. Yeah. The, the second one's where he's thirteen. Yeah, the teenager. And it's a whole and it's a whole sort of right. Damien hitting puberty kind of idea. And then the Damien third one. The yeah, uh, pretty much. <laughs> is he is he starting to live deliciously now that he's hit puberty? Is that what happens? That feels a bit creepy. It's, it's a yeah, heart, yeah. Things like that, you know. Yeah. No, but I thought with going back to the Father Brennan character. Yes. Obviously, he's unhinged in the omen. He's just yes. ranting and he's like he's not making a whole lot of sense. I thought there was kind of a through line with that, the fact that he never actually got to the point because in the first in the first omen, any time mm-hmm. when he was speaking to Margaret, he, he, he met Margaret, I think, like in a, a 
a plaza and by a fountain or something. Yeah. yeah. And he went up to her and said, You're in terrible danger, but I'm not going to tell you here. Come to my room and I'll tell you later on. <laughs> so even and then, if you've learned anything the about point. the Catholic Church, if a priest says to you, Come to my room, the answer yeah, is yeah, right, no. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. she was a nun. She was. She was. She would have been safe. You know. <laughs> have you got any? Have you got any brothers? <laughs> <laughs> so even then, and like that, kind of feeds into the fact. Yeah, that you're right. By the by, the end of the first omen, and we're not giving anything away here. Yeah. He doesn't succeed in his mission. So yes. by going into the omen film, the 1976 film. Is is playing catch up. He's trying to sort of right a wrong something he wasn't able to do, and yeah, you're you're right. Is he is babbling most of the time? But that's you, you find out with what about seventy five percent of films is usually because someone hasn't conveyed a piece of information to somebody else. Because yeah. if you do that, then the film's over in ten minutes. So yeah. he goes up to he, he gets a chance to see that. Yeah, that was another thing. The access he got to. <laughs> To the the U.S. ambassador to the court of St. James was unprecedented. You know, oh, there's a priest here to say, ah, I'd send him in. You know, it wasn't a problem. You know, and it was like hanging about outside his house and all sorts of stuff. And it's just, like, yeah. But then equally, all, all I weird. couldn't understand why. Now, obviously, they were taking photos because he was the U.S. ambassador. But are ambassadors that big a thing that you permanently have a photographer hanging around, like photographing your kid's birthday? Like, why is how does that character make sense? In a way, it does because traditionally the U.S. ambassador to the U.K. tends to go on to have a sort of a high-level political career. So they go on to become like vice presidents and things like that, and actually in high office. So it is seen right. as a stepping okay. stone. Maybe not so much for the Gregory Peck character because he was slightly older, but he, even he said that because when he said to his wife that he'd got that position she was like oh well you know that's a you know I'm, I'm going to be married to the president one day so that's kind of the stepping stone so it would be regarded as a public figure in that way before it became more of a an appointment for like a lackey the last couple of u.s ambassadors have just been basically nobodies because it's like the likes of trump and uh, obama and all that have just appointed people that have donated to their campaigns and things like that they're not political animals in the same sort of way so it's not regarded like that but in in that sort of respect yeah i can see why they would have a photographer but yeah maybe not to the extent he was actually doing it uh, on you go thomas well, there's a pretty sure it's the uh, the remake at the end of it it's got the same ending as the first as the original woman where he's mm -hmm. his dad's funeral but i'm pretty sure on the remake it's the president he's mm. one because quite, I, I don't know why the president would be left the child. And <laughs> um, the set, because obviously in the, in the original one, it's his brother that yeah. take, adopts Damien, and that makes perfect sense. But I don't know why yeah. the president would. I don't know why the ambassador would leave the, the president, his child, with the president because of that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, that really doesn't make sense. Anyways, I mean, I think that obviously. Patrick Triton was given the direction to to chew the scenery and then someone you did mention that you thought Billy Whitelaw did the same I actually really liked her performance in this um because I was reading that initially they pitched the character as a sort of jovial Irish nanny and she decided that she wanted to take it on this different more sinister route you obviously maybe didn't think she was that good to me no but... I did I thought I thought she was great in it but I mean it was the end though so like, I mean she's very kind of subdued and sinister but at the end she's gone total batshit and attacking him there is a, a few lovely close-ups of her eyes where I think that, especially like towards the end when things do start to get a bit even more satanic than they have been, the, the, the close-ups of her eyes I thought were really effective because you can actually see how, how crazy she is. But I did, obviously there's quite a famous scene where he knocks, Damien knocks his mother off the, the ladder while she's fixing the, the light or whatever it is. But I even like the build-up to that where Billy White was sort of standing over him and she's watching him go round and round and round and the little tricycle thing. And I actually thought that that her character kind of worked because she's the she's the supposed to sort of the equivalent of all the crazy nuns in the in the first one. I guess she's there to sort of like fuel his particular I don't know nature would you call it or she's just there to provide so basically she's the bad yeah. guy right? It's, it's that kind of way. It's like yeah, I mean it's like yeah, the Antichrist is born in a human body, but he's still a child. 
That's the thing. It's like he needs people to look after him, make sure he's okay. He can't do a lot of stuff. Until I, don't he know, I just don't understand why the Antichrist can't, wasn't just born like able to dress himself. Because surely the whole thing is like he's supernatural. Like it is strange how yes, he is a child and he needs looking after. But that to me, it always kind of doesn't make sense because if he's this powerful being, yeah, but it's, it's, that from it's, the it's, offset. It's, but it's the same with Jesus, isn't it? It's like um, we don't see Jesus floating about as a, a two-year-old, like uh, for miracles, and that he waits to matures and gets into adulthood and things before it starts being his full potential. <laughs> no, but that's the idea. But it's, that's the idea. No, it's I like, know. But I'm also just laughing because you're like properly schooling me in this, and I actually did this at school. And I just don't remember a fucking thing. <laughs> But John, what did you think of her performance then? Because again, I she was the kind of standout for the film for me. I really enjoyed her character. Yeah, like you say, she was dark and very sort of quiet and still from the early parts of it. And then the story itself dictated that she became this evil, horrible nanny towards the end of it. And her performance was particularly good. Yeah, it was it was the the most out there performance, I think of the film and she did it per per perfectly well like you say she was originally told no she's going to be this sort of sweet person but decided to go in a different direction and they obviously accepted that so that's you know it's a, it's nice that they actually did that as well because it adds to the film rather than taking away because it would have been so easy to just make her you know basically a nothing role and i don't suppose like billy whitehall would really want to take on a role like that in the first place. She wants she would want to stand out. So yeah, it make, makes kind of perfect sense. The whole thing about her actually coming into the the story in the first place is completely nuts as well because <laughs> it's like, you know, oh, where did you get her? What do you mean? Where did you get her? Where did you get her? <laughs> and that was only one. I've got a few things that I'd like to <laughs> talk about in a minute or two, but uh, we can save that. So did well, you... I only had really one more uh -huh. thought on this, and it was just that Catherine, like the character of Catherine, like her fears about Damien are often dismissed, and she's kind of seen as like hysterical postpartum. So I do think, to a certain extent, this film does touch on women's health not being taken seriously, but obviously just not quite on the scale of the the first Roman, which is obviously about bodily autonomy in general. But I thought that that was quite an interesting wee subplot that doesn't really go anywhere, obviously, because it's lost in amongst all the sort of melodrama and chaos. But I don't know if you guys picked up on that as well and what you thought about it. Yeah, she's just a vessel, isn't she? In the yeah. same way that in the first omen, it's just a, a vessel for the Antichrist. So, yes, there's, there is a way, yeah, or, you know, she's just having a bit of a moment, you know, she, she needs rest and all this sort of stuff, not been taken seriously, which, yeah, that's a theme that kind of runs through the films, the female character, the main sort of female characters not being taken seriously at all. So, yeah, that is particularly relevant. And, yeah, it, it didn't go into any great depth in it because there was... It, the film is really exploring other elements of it. Like I said, they had to fit in the detective... <laughs> 45 minutes of detective work in there as well so you know yes but yeah it it was uh, nice to see it I think yeah I don't know if it was necessarily intended to be that sort of theme mind and it was just a case of crazy post-pregnant women yeah and the thing is well I mean like to be fair would you have took her seriously what if somebody if somebody said that they thought the child was the antichrist mm -hmm. perhaps not <laughs> I'm like, do you need some sea air and a valium? Would that make you feel better? Interesting regarding the kind of, the kind of ambiguity idea of uh, Richard Donner wanted that for the movie. He wanted a case of uh, the death trying about him being more kind of accidental and to the point of the audience thinking, well, is it a coincidence or is it actually the devil? And the writer, David Seltzer, said, eh, no, that's just the, the idea of the devil. It's a bit of an interesting story, which it is. The idea of it being very ambiguous, I don't know if it works the same. See, I, actually would, I would have preferred that, actually, rather than just an outright, this child is the Antichrist, which mm. obviously is what the, the first woman sets up to be, because she's literally impregnated by the devil. And but then there's like two and three that clearly... Yeah, but I think I would have preferred a sort of, you know, is it all in her head, or is it 
is it him? I think I would have preferred that as a storyline, but obviously we can't turn back the clock and, and undo no. what's been done. John, you obviously had a list of complaints, I think, maybe about the film, and I'm, no. I'm willing to just let you let you go free on this one. They weren't actually complaints, but something that was noticeable was obviously the Gregory Peck character is a very sort of high level official. He never yes. seemed to have any staff or guards around him at any point or in the house <laughs> to look after the photographer. <laughs> yeah, to, to look after the house, to look after his way. Where were where was all the staff when all the shit was going down, you know? That was a that was a wee, a wee one. There was also, like you mentioned, with the daggers as well. Now, if I was in charge of a Satanist cult and we were going to bring the Antichrist <laughs> into being, the first thing I would do was look up all the references in the Bible and find out all the things that can kill him and then go and find them because yeah. they wouldn't be too hard to find because Gregory Peck found it in about 30 minutes. So... <laughs> <laughs> that was to Israel. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> so why aren't the Satanists doing this as well, you know? And the, the big one for me was the fact that obviously the Antichrist is being born into the world and they realise that he has to be protected until he can be trained and told of his true purpose. So why give him to the US ambassador to bring up in full public glare? Why not keep him in a monastery? Why not keep him in the Italian countryside? Well, because because I, I, know, not... I, know what you're, I know what you're going to say, because like ultimately he's, he's supposed to be born into power and therefore he's, uh -huh. he's going to use that as yeah. the power base but with the forces that are actually behind him he could do that at any time that is it, true I think, I think it's more the kind of idea of um infiltration so they kind of touch on this with a second one as well when he gets sent to the military school yeah where his family oh, i was going to ask who trained him but they obviously explain that well, <laughs> lance hamerskin is his um of his corporal but I've got a commanding officer but he when he realizes who he is as <laughs> I see that actually I mean it, it's well done but you could interpret it for it takes him into his office he's like your potential Damien like even I knew and things like that and you're like see a mental <laughs> degree I'm not going to shoot what's going on here yeah um, it could have gone one or two ways yeah but... yeah and the time the first film comes when Sam Neill plays the adult Damien um, oh my god you, you like him in this film it's a terrible, terrible film, but his performance is fucking awesome in it. Oh, I so might watch good. it in just because of that, because I still think that Gregory Peck was absolutely gorgeous in this as well. Double chins on those polo necks or not, I was like, yeah, he is very... Everything about him just said, yeah, you work in something powerful, because he was just gorgeous looking. So the thought of Sam Neill as the I, Antichrist piqued my interest slightly. The, the, the film's absolutely terrible. It's got one of the worst endings to a film I've ever seen. It's just fucking nonsense. Oh. Um, he, however... Is great in it, and there's, a, there's some cracking scenes when he keeps walking. He's got a statue of Jesus on the cross mm -hmm. that he keeps then talking to. And as I see him, is like he grabs out the crown of thorns and he goes, "I'm going to grab this crown and push it deeper into your skull." They take his hands away, and he's all bleeding. And those scenes are brilliant. For anything Sam Neill's on screen, it's great. But he becomes him. Sorry, long story short, he becomes the ambassador in that film. Right, Johnson as well. It's that clear route to. Of the presidency, yeah. to at which point you've got the most powerful man in the world as the literal devil and thinking the stuff he can do. But you know what I don't understand? Because I don't think the Catholic Church has thought this through, right? They're obviously trying to unleash the Antichrist, and but then if he becomes president, which presumably is the case as the, the films progress, what power do the Catholic Church have over the presidency? Because typically, as history would tell us there's only ever been one catholic president of the u.s because it's typically wasps that do this job so what what is their end goal here how do they think they can have power over him once he's the president i realize it's actually nonsense no, no. i think, I think, it's, debate, I think but... it's fair to say that the catholic church's plan wasn't very well thought through yeah because if they thought I mean, that was going to bring them more money because people were panicking yeah. And I basically sat in a book brainstorming ideas and they're like which think we should do uh, bring some more money and people back to the catholic church how about we buff the Antichrist? And um, sometimes somebody else around says, I was thinking of a fundraiser. <laughs> 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 oh, 
<laughs> so there is point so to be ready to do a bake sale. And Aye, so that's good. I've actually got the devil in the basement just ready to fuck. But if you want to make your fairy cakes, you can yeah, do I mean, guys, we've already started this plan, so we're as well really seeing it through. But, but I think I think you understand how that plan was going to work. So it's so, okay. So the Antichrist comes into power, darkness travels the world, and people then flock to the church. Then what happens? <laughs> Well, this is what I mean. So were they going to then take him down to prove their power and prove that they could save everybody by, because they would, because presumably they would also know about the wee daggers. Exactly. Are you going to watch the third film by the chances of anybody just spoil the show to it? No, you can spoil it. I mean, I feel, seen it I, yeah, I, but, yeah, yeah, I feel like I'll probably watch it at some point, maybe after Kung Fu's Dracula. <laughs> when the third one, you've got adult Damien at this point, but uh, Jesus. Sam Neil Damien. Jesus is born, and then they so Damien, there's a, there's a scene, the there's a, yeah. So, there's a few scenes when basically it starts getting the firstborn sons born in this state and it's killing them all. And I'm like, this is one of the most fucked up things I've seen in the film. <laughs> but at this point, it was like a made for TV movie as well, it was fucking terrible. So, it's like even there, it's just jarring in that kind of sense. But he's got all these disciples, this scene goes to like a quarry or something. He's got all his disciples, but he's got kids and stuff. And there's so many questions raised, like, why have kids devoting their life to him? Like, like, nine-year-olds. Do you really want to go down this particular rabbit hole about why are uh, children involved? Here's, in the, here's the thing as well, and it's like, it's, the whole film, you're thinking to yourself, at what point does God intervene? Because they're clearly saying Jesus in this film. So it turns out that Damien, Damien then thinks that it's his trusted aide who's son is Jesus. Doesn't seem to be the case either. And they, 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 it's almost like they're running out of money and they kind of just rush the ending. And there's a scene when they eventually kill Damien with the daggers and Jesus appears <laughs> and this big like, ball of light and then it ends. And I'm like, what happened there? <laughs> so maybe that was just like, I thought I was just the whole time. God will sort it. God will sort exactly. it. But I can understand as well why they decide to sort of ask for have Jesus fight Damien. It's an old story, the Antichrist versus Christ. That's that's how the world's going to end. But why not have Jesus born about the same time? Because Damien's got a good head start on by this point. I don't know. And I don't know why Jesus was born in the 80s either, too, because as far as I know, your timeline's slightly out. Now, I obviously didn't pay attention it's on coming. it at school. But, no, it's oh, the second, second coming. So this, this is building up to the Armageddon, where... The daggers came from is it Medigo? Medigo is called. Yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be the place of Amazon again, which they changed to I think London, a Norman free. But <laughs> that's right. He was born in England. Jesus was born in England. He was born in England. <laughs> this idea is that is <laughs> tremendous. Even the poster. Why the posters for Roman free has him the presidential seal in the background? Now, that's really false advertising because it yeah. makes you think he's president in the film and he's not. But the power thing, it does make sense in, this, in a way to kind of put him in somewhere, a position of power, a wealthy family. Then just working in Tesco or something, it's going to take him a bit longer to kind of get full power. And get he's got a supernatural, way. and it's not just about his supernatural power, it's his manipulation and all that. And what he can do, he's not just throwing fire and stuff. There's budgets for these kind of things, so they scale back a bit. Uh, do either of you have anything you want to add about your viewing experience with the first omen or the omen? And would you recommend either of these films? I, yeah, sorry. No, uh, just wanted to say it's the film turned out to be Gregory Peck's biggest payday because he took a cut price rate up front for 10% mm -hmm. of the gross and the film grossed $60 million and it was his biggest payday of his career, which Smart is... Smart and sexy, yep. Pretty, pretty decent. I would recommend seeing this film just for the experience of seeing this film it's it's okay there are very good points in it there are a lot of very dated points like we've discussed in it but yeah it's still worth giving it a watch i think i i would give it a watch especially for the, the main performances alone and what about you Sammy? I mean, what are your thoughts on both films i'd recommend both i'd recommend them all i mean if you're gonna watch the first one just watch the whole series the only one i didn't get a chance to rewatch was four because it wasn't disney plus um it's damien's daughter um, as, a, as a podcast for another time um, <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd recommend both like I said my thoughts on the first one I enjoy for what it is I think it's really overhyped you go back and watch Exorcist you can see why that's regarded as one of the greatest horror films yeah. ever I fail to see that with the woman personally 
I think mm-hmm. it's a good film. I think it's a good horror film. I just don't put it in the same high regard. Um, I thought the first one was a better film and more or less every way apart from maybe the fun factor, which we commented on. What I would say is I thought the film was too long. I thought they could have shared about 15, 20 minutes off it easily and it would have just been as effective. I mean, I, I like a slow burn. A lot happens in like the last 15 minutes. So mm-hmm. I think you could have cut some time off maybe near the beginning or the middle and the better paced. Where I think the film, in my opinion, um, has its biggest issue is that uh, Immaculate was a better movie. Oh, I've not seen that yet. And they kind of came out right about the same time. There was like two yeah. skinny films out. You pretty much, I mean, the, the plots are virtually identical. It's very much that twin movie idea where your films like Deep Impact, Armageddon. Mm-hmm. And it's very common. It's, it's, not unco- it's, not, it's not uncommon for movies to do that. To have like two very similar films come out at the same time. One's not a rip off for the other. Both have been production for years. It's just a coincidence to an extent. And then sometimes we'll bring both films out at the same time a tie it as marketing. But there's usually a loser in that mm. case. And the first one was better received than Immaculate. I do believe Immaculate did better. That was also riding that Sydney Sweeney High, where she just can't do no wrong at the moment. And she is really good in the film as well. Um, but that's got that star appeal to it. This film didn't. And I think if a Michael Hand came out, I might have enjoyed the first one more. But it was yeah, hard so. not to keep thinking back of a movie that was released only a few weeks ago. I did enjoy better. I did enjoy more. That is interesting. This is, yeah, I haven't seen Immaculate. I mean, I absolutely loved the first woman. I do think that the last scene is unnecessary. Apart from that, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, well. I think so. It's um, too much of a fan service. Yeah, Avengers type moment where you're supposed to go, <gasps> and yeah. I just didn't. And I just, yeah, I just didn't do that. It just annoyed yeah. me more than anything else because that felt grubby. Whereas the rest of the yeah. film, up until, I felt had maintained its integrity as a sort of individual film. That felt a bit grubby. I definitely would recommend the first one because I did really enjoy it. I love the layers to it, and I particularly like, as I say, there's lots to to unpick about sort of bodily autonomy and all that sort of thing. So I really enjoyed that. The Omen was a wee bit of a disappointment. I have to say it was way more cheesy and camp than I thought it was going to be. And as I say, I kind of laughed at some of the bits that were obviously supposed to be a bit more violent and scary, which is definitely not the point. But if you want to check either of these films out, The First Omen, I believe, is still clinging on to cinemas. And The Omen is on Disney+, Plus, where you can also find The Omen 2, The Omen 3, and The Omen remake from the early 2000s. That is... All we have time for on this podcast, but we will be back soon. John, if somebody wants to email you that is not spam for selling weird blue pills online, what is yeah. our email address? <laughs> it is podcast at moviescramble.co.uk and the emails have still been flying in. We're getting all sorts <laughs> of spam rubbish at the moment for the number one pillow in the UK and things like that. So, And not so much pills, pillows. It's kind of targeted towards the older audience as well. <laughs> start sponsoring us then. Yeah, yeah, you would think, yeah. That would be nice. You can also find us on social channels at Movie Scramble and all the usual places. And if you want to join John's satanic cult, which he's clearly thinking about starting <laughs> up, feel free to slide into his DMs directly. But until next time, thank you very much for listening and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.